An ideal gas is a way that we have of modeling the behavior of gases, and it comes down to three gas laws, the first of which you will probably be familiar with from GCSE, which is Boyle's law. For a fixed mass of gas at a constant temperature, pressure is inversely proportional to volume. Now there are two ways to write that. Pressure is inversely proportional to volume or pressure times volume is equal to a constant. They are the same thing. If you were to do this experiment, then you get a graph that looks something like this. If you double pressure, you half the volume. Then there's Charles' law, and that's for a fixed mass of gas at a constant pressure, the volume is proportional to temperature. So volume is proportional to temperature, or volume over temperature is equal to a constant. Then there's the Gay-Lussac law, or sometimes referred to as the pressure law. For a fixed mass of gas at a constant volume, the pressure is proportional to the temperature. So that can be written as pressure is proportional to temperature, or pressure over temperature is equal to a constant. These two give us graphs that look something like this. And I'll talk about that in a moment with how that is used to measure absolute zero. So these are straight lines through the origin. For me, it's worth learning both of these ways of expressing proportionality. One might be more useful for one situation and another might be more useful for another situation. They'd both be useful for different times when they'd expect you to maybe use proportional reasoning, either in a written question or even in a calculation question where they tell you a change in one thing and expect you to work out the change in another thing. You can combine these three gas laws to give you the ideal gas equation, and that is PV equals NKT. Pressure times volume is the number of molecules of a gas multiplied by the Boltzmann constant multiplied by the absolute temperature. There's two ways to write this equation though. There's that first one, and there's also this one, PV equals NRT. Now little n is the number of moles, and R is the molecular gas constant you will be expected to use both or either of these ideal gas equations. They are the same thing though, NK is equal to NR. If you haven't done that, it's well worth taking these three equations and actually combining them to give you the relationship between pressure, volume and temperature in an ideal gas. The number of molecules, that's capital N, is related to the number of moles by the equation N equals NNA. <laughs> so the number of molecules is equal to the number of moles multiplied by Avogadro's number. And this means therefore that the molecular gas constant and the Boltzmann constant are also related by R equals KNA. Avogadro's number is the number of molecules in any one mole of a substance. And that is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23 per mole. So that is how many molecules are in one mole of any substance. Some A-levels only require you to use one or the other, but in OCR they require you to use both. The ideal gas is a model, it's a way of explaining evidence. The evidence are the free gas laws and we combine them into this model of ideal gas. This slide is going to give us the detail on how that model works. It starts with the idea, the Newtonian idea, that gases exert pressure on the surfaces of their containers. And that is the same equation as static pressure, so that's pressure is force over area. The kinetic model of gases, the ideal gas model, assumes that we have a large number of molecules in random and rapid motion. So if you think about the Avogadro constant, we do indeed have a very large number of molecules, and we sometimes refer to this as statistical physics. It also assumes the molecules apply negligible volumes compared with the volume of the gases, so they can be thought of as points. It also assumes that the collisions are perfectly elastic, which is that there's no transfer of kinetic energy to anything else during the collisions. It also assumes that the time in which the collisions happen is negligible compared to the time between the collisions. So the time of the collision is very, very short, essentially. Too short to worry about. It also assumes that the intermolecular forces are negligible, so that the gas molecules are so far apart that it's not worth considering the forces between them. Except, of course, during the collisions between the particles and between the particles and the walls. So it's because those forces are negligible that we can say that the particles have zero potential energy in this model. And that effectively means that the internal energy is just the sum of the kinetic energies of the particles in the model. Pressure and volume are related to the average kinetic energy by this equation. Hopefully you can see the mc squared is a sort of expression which is related to the kinetic energy. Now you don't need to actually derive this from the assumptions in the model in the OCR A level. It is a really good exercise though for you to understand how that model arrives at this equation. So I do have a full video where I go through the derivation of that equation. It's a good way to understand the importance of those assumptions that the model makes.
So this states that pressure times volume is equal to a third multiplied by the number of particles times the mass of each particle times the RMS speed squared. Now we'll talk about RMS speed in just a moment, the root mean square speed. But you can combine this first equation with the ideal gas equation to give this. A half mc squared, so that is the average kinetic energy of the molecules, is equal to 3 over 2 kT, and that's the Boltzmann constant times absolute temperature again. And you do need to be able to derive that from the previous two equations. So you need to be able to take these two equations from the ideal gas molecule and derive this third. You should probably see that's a case of making them equal to each other and doing a little bit of rearranging. We can say that the kinetic energies or the speeds of these particles in any ideal gas are distributed in what we call a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And that looks something like this. There are a few key characteristics that you need to be familiar with of this type of distribution. Let's just make sure we understand the graph first. It's a frequency graph. It tells you how many molecules are at each speed. So these are the higher speed molecules. You see there are fewer of those than this kind of average speed of the molecules. And the dotted line shows a higher temperature, which is lower peak and shifted towards the right of the graph. So the key features are there are zero particles with zero kinetic energy, and that means the lines intercept the origin. There are no particles with no kinetic energy. That has to be the case. And it also shows there's no maximum kinetic energy possible. So if you think back to absolute temperature, there's, there's an absolute zero, but there's no theoretical maximum. So we don't tie the line to the x-axis in the higher speed range. So the line does not touch the x-axis to the rightmost end of the distribution. Now the higher temperature, the flatter that curve goes and the further to the right it goes. So there's the same overall number of particles in these two distributions. It's just that more of the particles are higher kinetic energy or higher speed for the higher temperature. Now I've talked about averages so far, but there are three different averages that we're using here. The mode is the most frequent, so that is the peak. So the modal speed is the peak of the graph, wherever the speed is at the peak of the graph. The mean speed in a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is gonna be slightly higher than that because we have that idea that there's zero at zero, but there could be some at very, very high kinetic energies. There's no theoretical maximum. So the mean is gonna be slightly above that. And then lastly, the RMS speed, which we give the symbol C, is the root mean square speed. And that's an idea that we use when we're modeling ideal gases is when we want to ignore the vector nature of that motion. So because one speed could be a positive and one speed could be a negative, if we square them all, then we get rid of those negatives. But we have to then root again to get back to what we call the root mean square speed, the RMS speed. But that effect of squaring and then rooting actually leaves us with a slightly higher RMS speed than a mean speed. It's not a massive distinction to make, but it's an important one. The RMS of something is not exactly the same thing as the mean. You need to know how we can investigate the ideal gases and how we get to this evidence for this model. And you can investigate all three gas laws, but in this specification, they only expect you to know how to investigate Boyle's law and the Gay-Lussac law. So Boyle's law can be investigated using a pump and a pressure gauge, and you vary the pressure and you measure the volume of a trapped mass of gas. It's usually done with a fixed piece of apparatus that, that is just set up in your labs at school. It can also be done by loading a fixed syringe with some slotted masses. So we increase the pressure by adding slotted masses and we use force over area of the syringe to give us a pressure. You plot a graph of pressure on the y-axis versus one over volume. So that's the same graph as we had with the inverse proportional on the previous slide, but we've actually manipulated the algebra to give us a straight line through the origin. That shows that pressure is inversely proportional to volume. The Gay-Lussac law can be investigated using a submerged spherical flask. So we have a fixed mass of gas in a flask and that is submerged in a water bath and that's linked up to a pressure gauge. We vary the temperature and we measure the pressure for that trapped mass of gas. And then again, we can plot pressure versus temperature and that should give us a straight line. We extrapolate that back, that's what is going on with the dotted line there, until it cuts the x-axis. And that is our experimental estimation of what absolute zero is going to be. That is going to give us a really large uncertainty because in the school lab at least we can only really measure temperatures of any gas between sort of 0 and 100 degrees Celsius because we're using a water bath to do it. So there's not a lot of data between our actual line and our extrapolated intercept with the x-axis. So you do tend to get quite large differences from absolute zero. But actually repeated measurements of this can actually get you reasonably close to absolute zero even in the school lab. My pro tip for any PAGs or any practical which is mentioned specifically in the specification is to make sure you consider all the evaluative points.
So for example, in the typical Boyle's law apparatus, the pressure gauge is actually analog. So that's an example of when you have to actually interpolate between scale markings. And this can be less precise, but it doesn't have as much random error as maybe a fluctuating digital pressure gauge would have. And again, for example, in the Boyle's law apparatus, when you are pumping the gas, you're actually doing work on it. And so that is going to raise its internal energy. It could actually increase the temperature of the gas. And that could mean that one of your control variables had also changed and that would make your conclusion less valid. We also in the apparatus use a analog scale of the volume, and that can lead to a parallax error when you're actually measuring that volume. So you get down to eye level and you make sure that your volume is as close to the scale as possible to limit the parallax error. <laughs>